All right. Good morning, everyone. I think I'm on. Am I on? Yes. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's wonderful to see all of you here. And um, it's awesome. We're going to have uh, lunch right afterwards. So please stick around. So we're going to be celebrating for lunch. We're going to be having pancakes and uh, eggs, and sausage, breakfast. So today, technically, if you follow kind of the larger liturgical calendar, is the start of Carnival. Carnival will go from now until Mardi Gras, which is Tuesday, Fat Tuesday, and then Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. Well, Fat Tuesday, if you look at kind of the, the, the Catholic and the high liturgical churches, those are, those are times where you go out and you eat and you drink because starting on Ash Wednesday, you start giving up those kinds of luxuries of life for, throughout Lent. Well, the lower liturgical churches developed this tradition of Shrove Tuesday, which we're celebrating on Sunday um, here. But Shrove Tuesday was a way to kind of get rid of all the rich foods in your in your house, sugar and butter and uh, uh, cream and stuff like that. And they did it by coming up with the crazy idea of just eating lots of pancakes. So in some parts of the world, it's actually called pan <clears throat> Pancake Day or Shrove Tuesday. Someday, when the weather is better and we've got kind of different circumstances, we'll do some of the stuff they do in Europe, like pancake races, pancake throwing, all sorts of fun stuff. For today, we're just going to eat lots of pancakes. So hang around afterwards. Um, it's great to have you here. If you haven't been here before, you know, restrooms, make your, just make yourselves at home. Pretend you're, pretend you're at my house. Just do whatever, whatever you need to do. It's good to have you here today. A um, couple of announcements. So we got the lunch today. Next Sunday, 4 to 6 p.m. is the chili cook-off at Neomed. We're going to defend the, the two-time defending champs here. Fairhaven Church would love have you there to bring home a third one and just kind of complete the trinity of championships, right? So um, come out to that youth group. We're going to be meeting there next week around 345. And just every year that we've been there, the youth group has had this awesome presence at the Chili Cook-Off. Um, and it's great. They're kind of helping out, saying hello. Um, it's a great way to get some service hours. It's a great way to help out the community and uh, represent the church too. Um, um, and then on the 25th, we're back for our Sunday night, uh, the Chosen Study over at Dave's house from 6 to 8 p.m. So if you're available on the 25th, come on out. That is a great, great um, time. It's a great time of study and fellowship and eating. So uh, please come on out for that also. Um, volunteers, first off, thank you all. Um, had some great responses to our call for volunteers the last few weeks. We've gotten a few people to uh, come and help become new volunteers helping out with setup. Um, Wednesday night, we got four new volunteers, which is wonderful. I'm um, having those extra hands on Wednesday nights. I'm still looking for some volunteers to help out with Sunday mornings. If you're interested with that, with the kids in the back, please let us know. And still looking for someone to kind of be the point person on the setup for that. So continue to keep that in prayer. We'll continue to uh, bring that up as well. Um, also, oh, another announcement. Is John back? John? Yeah, John, you want to make an announcement from our kind of our outreach missions team? So we'll be, if, for those of you that didn't hear, we'll be collecting Raymond slash ramen noodles for the next month or so. There'll be a collection. There'll be a collection thing in the back. Doesn't matter the flavor. Just pick some up when you're out. If you see them, uh, grab some and drop them off to church. Um, and we'll put that in the email and the bulletin going forward and stuff like that. Any other, I think that's it for announcements for now. Yeah, great, yes. That's prayer requests. Don't, don't. Pastor's daughter always has to skip ahead. Um, all right, we have a few celebrations that we're gonna mention and maybe some, some birthdays to uh, talk about. First, I don't wanna embarrass her, but my friends Pam, Pam, and Mike celebrated a wedding anniversary, a big one. What was it? 33? 33 years of marriage. So that's huge. That is, that, is, that is awesome. And then they're not here, but the shorts have their wedding anniversary today, too. I think I read like 46 years or something like that. So that's pretty huge, right? Um, and we have, we have some birthdays. I know we have to hit some birthdays. 
One of them, oh, Nora's not, she's in the back. So I've heard all week that my wife has told me that Nora here at the daycare has been very adamant that we need to celebrate the fact that her birthday is on Monday, Lori's birthday is on Tuesday, and my birthday is on Wednesday. And so she's been telling her for like a week how pumped she is. All these birthdays are in a row. So when you see Nora, since she's not back here, make sure today you tell her happy birthday. Maybe when they come out to eat later, we'll sing to her. Sing happy. Any other birthdays or blessings that we want to add? Lucy, when's Arlea's birthday? Happy birthday to Arlea. She's back there. Arlea, how old are you? 15? Awesome. Any others? Oh, where's Lacey? She's in the back cooking, ain't she? Oh. All right, here's what we're going to do. Dave, remind me, we'll sing all the birthdays afterwards while we're eating. Oh, is she? Hold on. All right, Kathleen, tell me. We sing after, not before. That next week, next week you can all sing for me. We did hers last week. All right, so on three, we're going to sing for Lacey and Arlea. Okay? One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. All right, brothers and sisters, it's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Why don't you stand with me? as we open up our worship service this morning.
seated. Brothers and sisters, let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us, Lord. And truly, Lord, your name is blessed, and we call on you now. Lord, we ask you as we're here gathered as brothers and sisters in the faith, that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would watch over us, Lord, that you would, um, with all of your grace and all of your love, wash us clean. Let us stand before you, Lord, perfect because of your sacrifice, because of your blood, that you purchased us for our eternal salvation, Jesus. We thank you. Lord, we lift up to you the prayers of our church. Lord, today we lift up to you Eric and Lee. We lift up to you, Clark's mom, Kirsten, Lord God. We continue to pray for, for John, we pray for Matt, we pray for Dr. Repke and for Mackenzie with her upcoming surgery. We lift up to you, Brian, Lord God, watch over him. Lord, we pray for our Leah as she makes her Chrysalis weekend next weekend. We pray for all of the team members for, for Chrysalis and for Emmaus coming up that you would watch over. Lord, we lift up to you all of the other prayers that we have within our hearts that have gone unspoken. For Lord, you know all things, and there's nothing we can hide from you. You tell us in the scriptures that you will never leave us or forsake us. You tell us in the scriptures, Lord, to cast our worries and our anxieties upon you, for you love us. Let us always remember that. Lord, we pray for our church and for our community. We pray, Lord, that you give us, your church, the strength and the wisdom and the grace to fulfill the mission that you've given us of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, of sharing that there is freedom from sin, Lord, in your name. Lord Jesus, we love you. Help us to love you. We're thankful for the gifts that we receive from you, that they're given with cheerful and generous hearts, knowing that all things come from you and all things return to you. Jesus, we love you, and we ask for this in your precious name. Amen. Usher.
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we have the opportunity to come together and worship you freely. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with each person who's here today. Lord, I pray that you'd be with those who can't be with us. Lord, I pray that you'd be with those who are sick, those who are hurting. Lord, I pray that you'd be with Pastor Vince this morning as he delivers his message. I pray that you'd uh, open our hearts and minds to hear what he has to say, to learn, to apply it to our lives. I pray that you'd be with each of us as we take it with us throughout the week, that we can witness to each other, to other people, to help them to see the love that you have for them. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, if you want to turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 4, Mark chapter 4, this is going to be the last uh, week in our Epiphany series. Starting next week, we'll be in our Lent series. Um, we'll be focusing a lot more on themes of sacrifice. This week is going to be the last week. They're going to be talking kind of about new beginnings and newness and growth. We're going to be in Mark 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 20. Now, this is commonly known in a story that if you've been going to church for any length of time, really, you probably know the parable of the sower and the seed. Um, title that I gave this message is, what kind of dirt are you? And I think it's a fair question to ask. Every one of us is dirt. Every one of us was formed out of the ground. and God breathed his life into us. But we're all dirt. So what kind of dirt are you? Today, we're going to be talking about some different kinds of dirt that are out there. Which one are you? Because we're all one of these. But which one are you? So Mark chapter 4, starting at verse number 1. Again, Jesus began to, act, begin, to te- began to teach by the lake. And the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. And then his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow seed. As he scattered the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up and the the plants were scorched, they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up grew and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And when he was done, the 12 and others around him asked him about the parables. And he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables, so that they may ever see, but never perceive, and ever hear, but never understand. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. And then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes the word away that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, They last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others are like seed sown among the thorns that hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Other seed sown on good soil hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30 some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, be with us. Fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit and make them tender to the leading of your word. Fill our ears and our minds with the Holy Spirit and make them attentive to your word. That we may learn your word, that we may love your word, that we may live your word. We ask for this in your name. So here we are, we're talking about this parable. And Jesus taught a lot in parables. In fact, 
there's very little evidence that any rabbis taught him parables before Jesus. It's kind of a teaching method that Jesus kind of founded. And this parable is conveying a message, right? Parables are, are stories with intent. And we're going to unpack this for a while over the course of this, of this message. But I want to start off by getting right into kind of a, maybe, maybe a recollection that some of you may have. I know that I've had this recollection for sure. But I was always amazed when I was a kid how I could carry on an entire conversation with my dad. And my dad would be looking straight at me. And he would even be nodding along as I spoke. And then at the end of the conversation would say, what did you just say? Like he completely didn't listen to a thing that I said. And here's the scary part. As a kid, I thought this was weird. But now I do that to my kids. And I hate it. Like, Dad didn't hear a word that just came out of my mouth. And honestly, I shouldn't be astounded because I'm pretty sure as a pastor, I have pretty good evidence that people sit there and listen to what I say and then they leave and they're like, I have no idea what he just said. But this is what we do. Because the reality is this, brothers or sisters, brothers and sisters, it is amazing what we choose to hear. It is amazing what we hear when we're actively choosing to listen. In today's story, we see how Jesus kind of couched his teachings in parables, these stories with intent that were really designed for those that were actually listening. This parable, this story here in Mark 4, kind of really starts Jesus' ministry. Before this, Jesus, we see him being baptized, being, being tempted out in the wilderness. This is really kind of the in earnest start of Jesus' teaching ministry. And Jesus' teachings are unparalleled. Some of the religious leaders who heard Jesus speak would walk away saying to themselves, who is this guy? No one has ever spoken like this before. They were mesmerized by the way he taught. And in fact, for those of you that watched The Chosen last week over at Dave's, remember that they walked away from the Sermon on the Mount like, this is incredible. Like, Who's ever taught like this before? The second part of verse one gives us the setting of the passage, right? There's this large multitude gathered. Jesus enters a boat, pushes off by the sea a little bit while everybody else is on land. And I share that and don't run past that because Jesus was a rabbi. And during this time, rabbis, when they were ready to teach, sat down. So the moment Jesus sat down, that would have been an indication to everybody, okay, he's now ready to teach. So if he's ready to teach, what should everybody else be doing? Listening, right? Everybody else should be listening. Jesus' parables were riveting because in the parables, Jesus would teach and open up spiritual truths in ways that people could understand. He would use these kind of homegrown, homespun illustrations that would draw immediately from the lives of everyday people. And they were very simply presented stories, but they had profound meanings, right? Most of the people Jesus was talking to were farmers. So hearing the story would, would totally make sense. So first, Jesus tells the story. So let's just kind of talk about the story, story just on, on, the, on the top level, on the high level. Verse 3 says, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And this introduction would have immediately captured their attention. This was a very agricultural society. And seeing a farmer going up and down furrows, sowing a plowed field during the planting season would have been normal, right? It would have been normal for them to see a sower going along, throwing seed on the ground. So he went out to sow, and he sowed this seed liberally. And why would he sow it liberally? Because not all of it would germinate, right? So you couldn't just put, I want, you know, you don't say, I want eight stalks of corn, so I plant eight corn seeds. You, you plant lots of them, and then you, you hope that you end up getting eight or, or more than eight, right? And they would plant every little bit of, of ground that they had. I've always kind of chuckled at this, but sometimes when you're when I would be driving down to Navarre or or to Orville, right? Or now I'm driving up to Garrettsville, I see these farms, and you would see this like land cut up, and there'd be like one little section of land that was like divided by a bridge. And even on that little section of land, there's corn planted, right? It's like no piece of dirt is going to waste. In verses four through eight, Jesus talks about the seed falling on different kinds of soil. Verse four, some of the of the seed falls along the path, and the birds of the air came and devoured it up. 
right? During this time, farmers' fields in the Galilee region were generally uh, very long and narrow, and there'd be paths dividing them in between. And those paths from walking and donkeys and wheels and whatever, they were, they were as hard as, as concrete. They were as hard as rock, right? So when the seed would fall on these paths, either just in walking or, or when it was being spread too close to the pathway, the seed would bounce off the hard soil. And immediately, hundreds of birds would come down and take it, right? And we've all seen, I, I, we don't see it that way here, but go throw some grass seed on your grass and you wake up the next morning and you feel like every blackbird in Portage County is in your front yard, right? Having a buffet out there on, on everything that you put out. The second soil says was shallow. Some fell on rocky ground. There wasn't much soil, so it sprang up because there wasn't a lot of a depth of soil. But when the sun came up, it was scorched and it burned. One of the big problems in this region of Galilee was that there was only about two to three inches of topsoil before you hit bedrock, before you hit hard rock limestone. So the, the seed would, would come up very quickly, almost, almost feverishly it would come up. But then you get that hot Mediterranean Middle Eastern kind of Chiraco kind of sun, and it would burn it up right away because there wasn't a good depth of root to keep the plant going. The, la the next soil that Jesus mentions is this thorny soil or, or weedy soil that's out there. The, these thorns that he's talking about are very common in this area of the Middle East, of, of, around the Galilee. And it was a constant nuisance to the farmers. And any of us that put in a garden know what a nuisance weeds are, right? Every time we start the garden, Grant has his favorite quote, like seriously, I don't have any tattoos, but if I ever tattooed one, it would be Gramps one saying when we put in the garden, he always says, Vince, remember one thing when it comes to weeds. Either you stay ahead of the weeds, or those weeds are going to stay ahead of you, right? If you're not on there every day, getting a little bit of the weeds out. Next thing you know, you go out after a week, forget it. The garden is done, right? You're, you can throw your hands in the air. And then the last soil that Jesus talks about is the good soil, where when the seeds fell, it took root and it sprang up. And not only sprang up, but it produced 30, 60, 100 fold of what was planted. And you can imagine this too, if you've ever planted a garden, what good, healthy, mulched up, composted soil looks like, right? It's soft and it's dark and it's, and it's crumbly. And it goes down several inches. I love when, when we get the tiller out, we till over the soil and all that stuff. My, first off, I love telling people that I till because it's very unusual. I don't do a lot of that kind of stuff. But when it's all done and that dirt is soft and you walk in it, you feel it in your hands and you step in it like you sink down to your ankles, right? Because it's so soft and it's, it's so healthy, right? And you put stuff... You put stuff in it to make it that way, right? Anyone who's driven down 44, when they start spraying that manure all over it, you know it smells bad, but it makes the dirt so good and, and, and so productive, right? That's the kind of, of soil that Jesus is talking about here, that, that good soil that gives the plants plenty of, of space and water and nutrients to grow deep roots and produce a huge crop. And just as it ended, just as this story ended, Jesus says, he who has ears, let him hear, right? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Here's the thing, brothers and sisters. Jesus wants us to listen to his word. And by listening to his word, he means he wants you to pay close attention to what he's saying. Notice that at the very end of the parable, Jesus was very happy or content with leaving the interpretation of the story up to his audience. He stopped at that point after the story. You know, they enjoyed a nice story, right? Most of them were farmers. I'm sure they're like, hey, it's a great story. Jesus the carpenter is telling me how to farm, right? It's, it's a very informative, right? Talked about different kinds of dirt and all this stuff. But he didn't go any further. He let them figure out the meaning and the significance of the parable. But then he goes into some teaching, right? And listen to this, verse 10. And when he was alone, those about him with the 12 asked him about the parable. You see, even the disciples who followed Jesus, they were puzzled by the parable. They were just as puzzled as the rest of the crowd. But what was the difference? 
The rest of the crowd heard the story and they were like, yeah, man, that's pretty good. But those around Jesus, the apostles, the ones that were really listening, they wanted to know more. What does this mean, right? They were puzzled. They, they were seeking to know a little bit more. It's like when Dr. Watson would always say, Vince, when, when the Holy Spirit puts it in your heart, that desire to, to seek a, a little more light, he said, seek it. Don't quench it. Don't put it out. Seek that little more light. Everybody in that, in that group that was there knew about so sowers. They knew about the properties of the seeds and, and all of these very interesting agricultural procedures that Jesus explained. But I'm, but I'm sure the apostles and those closest were saying, why is this religious rabbi talking to us about agriculture and farming unless there's more to the story than we think? And the disciples knew that there had to be more to the story. So they asked for that explanation. And what does Jesus say to them? He said in verse 11, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to those who are outside, everything is spoken in parables. That word mystery that's translated in English comes from the Greek word mysterion. And, and mysterion in, in Greek and mystery in this, in this sense doesn't mean something that's remote or complicated or hard to understand the way we would think it today. But rather what it means is it's referring to something that is quite unintelligible to any person that has not been initiated or instructed into what it means. But to those who have been perfectly instructed to what it means, it completely makes sense, right? And, and I was trying to think of a way to like really explain, ex try to relate this. And I really can't come up with any good examples except started watching this new show with my wife called The Blacklist which from what I understand has been around for a long time, but I've just now discovered it, okay? So the show's about the CIA. And there was one scene that I was watching a day or two ago. It was while I was writing this message and um, their, their, their secret site had been invaded by somebody. So they were calling in for help. And the one guy pick up, picks up the phone and the person that answers it says something like, you know, like, uh, you know, like uh, wayside furniture or something completely innocuous. And the guy just says something to the effect of like Hartfield 9191 and hangs up. What does that mean? And he was like, oh, we just called in for, he explained them. That, that, that was like the code to call in for the help. To me, that made no sense. But to the person on the other end of the phone who knew, knew exactly when they heard that, what it meant, right? That's, that's a way to think of mystery back then. To the initiated, it would have made sense. To the uninitiated, it would not have, right? One reason that Jesus spoke in parables was to bring these heavenly truths down to earth where people lived, but there was an element of concealment about it. That's why sometimes they're called mystery parables, because Jesus wants to see who was truly listening, who's actually paying attention to what is being taught. So in verse 12, Jesus says, so seeing they may see and not perceive and hearing they may hear but not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven. That's actually a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And sometimes that can sound a little harsh, but I like the way Matthew, Matthew and Mark share the same story. Matthew says it a little bit different. If you go to Matthew chapter 13, verses 11 to 13, in that part, Jesus replies like this, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. In essence, brothers and sisters, what Jesus was saying is this. The condition of a person's heart is going to determine their receptivity to the truth. The condition of a person's is going to determine their receptivity to the truth. So you think about the Pharisees and the scribes in Israel. They had originally been given all of this in a very straightforward teaching. And what did they do with it? They rejected it. So since they rejected it, ultimately, they lost it. It was taken from them. Those who receive the truth, brothers and sisters, and act upon it, on the other hand, are going to be given more truth. But those who reject the truth will ultimately lose the bit that they have. The parables here, they were full of truth. But they're full of truth. But for those that are truth rejecting, for those that don't want to hear it, they were unfathomable. They're completely unfathomable. And we can see this, 
this, this example all, all through our lives, physically. And I was so happy Jeff was here this morning. Uh, Brian's here now, but Jeff was here this morning. You know, he's, a, he's a, a, like a gym trainer, physical trainer, uh, whatever you call that. So he could verify what I was about to say. If you don't use certain muscles, right, eventually you will lose those muscles. You will lose the ability to use them. I remember my grandma, when she got really old, she kind of walked hunched over. And I, and I was like, Grandma, just straighten up. And like, I remember as a kid, I wanted to like push her, right? Like, just. But I found out that she didn't feel good, so she always slept in a recliner. She slept in a recliner for so long that the muscles used to straighten you up had gotten so weak that she couldn't straighten up anymore. Right. And that's what happens. Um, some of the kids, Sally, Lucy, they've asked me to like pull my drum set out. I haven't played my drum set in like 15 years. I'm sure that once I pull it out, I can play it. But I'm going to tell you right now, my right foot on my bass pedal, I guarantee is going to be slower than it was 15 years ago because I haven't played it in 15 years. If we don't use it, we're going to lose our edge. Italian was my first language. I didn't learn English till I was seven years old. I spoke Italian every day up until my grandparents passed away a few years ago. I've noticed it, even just since my grand, and I, I still speak Italian with my brothers when they're around. But not speaking it every day, I can catch that I'm a little slower when I speak Italian than I was five years ago because I don't practice it every day. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. If you reject the word, eventually you'll make it so that you can't receive the word. That's why Jesus gently, solemnly warns and rebukes them and tells them about receiving the word. That, and, and Jesus said to them, do you not understand the parables? How then will you understand? Um, do you understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? Jesus is saying, you've been with me all this time. I'm teaching you all the time. If you don't understand this, how will you understand everything? And if you were an apostle at that point, you've got to say to yourself, I better, I better listen up. Right, going forward, maybe I was slacking off a little bit, but now I really better pay attention. And now, at this point, Jesus ex explains, right? He explains and he exhorts what the parable is. In verse 14, Jesus starts, the sower sows the word. So Jesus right here makes one short, simple statement. Makes it very easy to understand. The seed represents the word of God. So what is the sower? The sower is anyone who is spreading the word of God. Anyone who is spreading the word of God, anybody, could be me, could be you, anyone who's spreading the word of God. The process of germination then and of growth, that whatever's in that seed, that's God's business. We're supposed to sow the word. And notice too here, this farmer in this story, he knew where the good soil was, right? He could have very easily carried his soul, his, uh, his, his seed, like very carefully, and then gone to the good soil and been like, and put it all there. But he didn't. As he was going, he's just throwing the seed everywhere. He's throwing the seed, the, the word of God everywhere. And that's what we're supposed to do. I could very easily find a bunch of people who are saved and love the Lord and just give them the word. That's easy. There you go. It's easy. But that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to throw the word everywhere. Everywhere we throw it. So that's what the seed is. It represents the word of God. From that point, Jesus then turns to the dirt. And this is when I said, what kind of dirt are you? This is Jesus now turns to the dirt. First, he talks about people with hard hearts, the hard path. Those are the ones on the path, it says in verse 15, where the word is sown. When they hear it, Satan comes immediately and takes it away. The hard path soil, brothers and sisters, are people who are hardened to God's word. And therefore, the Bible truth can find no entrance in their hearts. And the key word here is immediately, immediately. When people hear the word of the Lord, Satan or his agents, because Satan is not omnipresent the way God is. He's not everywhere the way that God is. They go to work. This is true, brothers and sisters. Every time the gospel is proclaimed, Satan's agents are there. They're like birds coming down to snatch away the word. They're like those flying monkeys in the Wizard of Oz, right? They just can't wait to come and take what is being sown. That's why when you hear the word, you need to respond to it immediately and not let the gospel be snatched away from your heart. Do you know how, how, how much it hurts me when I hear people say stuff like, you know, I don't really go to church now. I don't really get into my Bible, but when I have kids, I'm going to start going because I know it's important. Here, let me give you a little bit of 
of truth here. You're not. Because if you're not going now, what's going to make you change? I just had a discussion with a, with a youth, and this is for all you teenagers. I, I want you to hear this. I had a teenager say to me, I know when I get older, I'm going to be involved with church more because right now I'm just too busy. Heads up. Life doesn't get slower when you become an adult. This is the least busy time of your life. So if you can't make time for it now, it'll never happen. Don't let the word be snatched from you. Act on it immediately. Don't be hard-hearted because eventually you'll lose it. And nobody wants to do that. Secondly, Jesus talks about people with shallow hearts, the ones that fall along the rocky ground. They hear the word immediately. They receive it with gladness, but there's no root. They endure for a time, but when affliction or persecution arises, they immediately fall away. What Jesus is talking about here is people who, who make a profession of faith, but they don't take possession of their faith, right? They profess it with their lip, lips, but they never own it. These are people who maybe have an emotional experience, give mental assent to the gospel, but they never truly grapple with repentance. They never truly put their trust in Jesus for salvation. Jesus describes these people with rocky, shallow hearts as people who do well at first, but as soon as they face any kind of problem or, or anything doesn't go their way, they, they, they fail. They, they fall by the wayside. They give up. They basically prove that their profession wasn't, may not have necessarily been sincere or true. I, I can tell you, and Julia, remember this, she was there and so was Sally. I, I went to a live festival with them once for a whole week, and it was great. And at every concert, I saw thousands of kids go forward, and adults, when the bands would present the gospel. Yes, I'm saved. They'd fill out papers and stick them on this cross. I remember thinking, Every church in Stark County is going to need more chairs because there's thousands of people here giving their lives to Christ. And I got in the car after four days and people are flicking each other off as we're leaving because no one wants to wait in traffic. And none of them went to church afterwards. Winter Jam. I'm going to be taking a group of, of our youth to Winter Jam in a couple of weeks. You're going to see all sorts of people giving their lives to Christ. Hands up, everything. Lord, I love you. And come Monday will be gone because something happens. I don't like this. I don't like that. Gee, whatever. I didn't do good on this test. And they fall away. They have an emotional experience, but it, it doesn't take root in the heart. That's what happens when they fall on the thorny soil, on the, on the rocky soil. Then Jesus talks about people with crowded hearts who fall along the weeds. These are the ones that they hear the word of God, but all of a sudden the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things, come in and choke the word out and they become unfruitful. This time of uh, this time, Jesus gives a variety of hindrances that cause a person to focus on the world rather on this world, rather than the world to come. And Satan loves using those kinds of things against us. He has a perennial crop of different kind of weeds that he can put up to choke out the word. Jesus points out three of them. The first one he mentions is the worries of life. There's a certain amount of cares in this life that we're always going to have. We got to worry about bills and buying things to support our family, providing for things every day, keeping our house from falling into chaos. Jesus isn't saying that we should not take care of these things. He's saying that we shouldn't let those things crowd out the word. They should, we should not let those things crowd out our spiritual growth. The second thing that Jesus mentions is the deceitfulness of wealth. You know, wealth causes you're focused to change and to be focused on this world, not the eternal world. And we all know it. Wealthy people tend to be independent. They tend to be self-sufficient. I don't need God because things are going good and I can take care of everything myself. Riches, riches tend to insulate people from the harsh realities other people face. So they frequently are deceived about their need for the gospel. And, they, and the call for sacrifice and generosity does not appeal to those who are, who are deceived in that way. And lastly, Jesus mentions the desire for other things. This is a big one because we as people have a long list of stuff that we want. I want this next, right? This is going to be my next one. I, I, I can't just be happy here 
What is going to be my next one? Materialism. It can so change a person's focus to earthly things that it chokes out heavenly things. And most of all, it chokes out the gospel. And that's not good. That's why Jesus says later on in Mark, Mark 8, what will it profit a person to gain the whole world, but end up ultimately losing their soul? And sometimes we can become obsessed with it. You know, I'll give a, a, a little one here. I don't want to embarrass CJ, but CJ hated playing baseball. That kid played baseball for one reason and one reason only for as long as he did, because I wanted him to play baseball, right? I wanted him to be the next in a long line of great Italian baseball players. And it just wasn't going to happen. And every game, every year that I signed him up and every game that I took him to was miserable because he didn't want to be there. And I was thinking of every good reason to make him want to be there. When he was eight years old, his team won the first year kid pitch championship. I remember he got a trophy, all this stuff, right? And I thought, this is great, right? This is going to motivate him to want to play even more. And already the coaches, man, they won the championship next year. We're going to travel. Like they were already making plans. Like we were like the next, we're going to be like the next farm team for the tribe, right? Like we were ready to go. And some people do that to the detriment of everything else. I go, CJ, you going to sign up for baseball this year? He's like, nah. I said, why not? You won the championship last year. He goes, that's why I don't want to sign up. Won the championship. What else I got to do? I kind of joke. He has the trophy. We have it at home. But why chase it? Why does it always have to be the next? Why does it always have to be the next? Right? And then lastly, we get to the good soil. The good soil. The one where they hear the word, they accept it, and it bears fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. Brothers and sisters, the seed of God's word doesn't bounce off of this heart. It doesn't momentarily flourish only to shrivel under adversity and persecution. It's not crowded out by competing desires. It's not strangled out by competing options. This is a heart that allows God's word to take root and to grow and to produce fruit. And what kind of fruit does the heart like this produce? Paul tells us in Galatians, this kind of heart produces love joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Brothers and sisters, we need more hearts like that. The world needs more hearts like that. The world needs more good soil. How do we wrap all of this up? I'm going to wrap it up with a question for you. And each one of you has to answer. Not out loud, internally. Are you willing to hear God's word? And what are you going to do with it? Are you going to take it in and let it grow? Are you going to let it bounce right off when you walk out this door? Thanks for the pancakes. I'm out. Are we going to let it grow? Are you going to be good soil and produce fruit? Brothers and sisters, the devil, the world, sin, wants you to forget God's word and focus on some kind of emotional experience or or whatever it is to get through, but that's not going to get you through to heaven. It's not going to get you through salvation. Jesus was right. What good is it going to do if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? What good is it going to do? We need to answer those questions, brothers and sisters. I'm often reminded when I think about this sermon, because let's be honest, At different points of our life, we're all different kind of soils, right? I think there was a time in my life where my heart was hard, just like the soil, on, just like the path. And there were times in my life where I was the thorny soil, having the worries of the world choking out the word of God. Right now, I'm probably between the good soil and the thorny soil because I still worry about a lot of things. But God's there with us. Are we receptive to his word? And are we going to take it in or are we going to let it bounce off? I always find encouragement because we're never too far gone. and we're, we're always there to be able to turn to Jesus. In the book of Revelation in chapter 2, Jesus sends a message to his church at Ephesus. 
And that's a great message. And I think it's a great message for all of us to hear today. He says to them in that chapter, chapter two, verse five, remember from where you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. What's Jesus mean there? What are the works that you did at first? Believe in him. Place your faith in him. Repent and turn and follow him. And let's make sure that we all go out there as good soil. Amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Jesus, be with us and help us. Lord, help us not to have your word stolen from us immediately. Help us, Lord, to not have your word flourish for a short time and then fall away because our roots aren't deep. Lord, help us to not let the, the cares of this world choke out your, world, your word like weeds, but rather, Lord, help us to be that good soil. Help us within our hearts, Jesus, to produce a bumper crop for you. That we, Lord, can be the reason that the kingdom continues to grow in this world. Lord, we love you. Strengthen us in this. And we ask for this in your precious name. as we uh, get ready to end this part of the service, Lord, and enjoy some fellowship time together with some food. Lord, be present with us and truly let us focus on the cross, Lord. 
For through the blood you shed on that cross, Lord, you've pardoned us, you've sanctified us, that we can be new, Lord, and that we can be fruitful in the kingdom. So be with us, Jesus. Lord, we're thankful for the food that we're about to receive today. We're thankful for those that prepared it, Lord. And let yourself be present here among us, that we can truly enjoy our time together because we truly love you. Jesus, be with us always. We ask for this in your name. Amen. Amen. So are we all ready, Dave? All right. So please enjoy. Come on up and.